0 0.3 families of functions. Today we're going to take a look at a bunch of functions that we've seen in the past, plus get a preview of some function types that we're going to see in the future. What we're looking at here is a bunch of functions that fit the family y equals x to the n. Some of them you're more familiar with than others, such as y equals x and y equals x squared. You should be totally familiar with those. Other ones you've seen before, one thing that's worth noting is whenever n, the exponent, is even, both ends go up, or if there's a negative leading coefficient, both ends would go down. The important part is the n behavior, as we see right here, is that both arrows go the same way on the ends. Whereas when n is odd, even if n is equal to 1, you get n behavior that has one arrow go up, one arrow go down. That's always true with polynomials where we're looking at y equals x to the n for the leading term. We say two variables are inversely proportional if there's a positive constant. Again, constant means just a number called the constant of proportionality such that y equals k over x. An alternative and maybe easier way to think about that is when you multiply x and y together, you always get the same number. And the way I went from formula 1 to formula 2 was just multiplying both sides by x. So let's take a look at an example where we have an inversely proportional function. This table 0.3.1 shows some experimental data. Part A says explain why the data suggests that y is inversely proportional to x. If that's true, then we should be able to figure out some formula to figure out what k is. I think it's harder to figure out what k is in this case. I think it's easier to use the other formula. So let's take a look at this table. Look at the x values, look at the y values, see if the pairs multiply together to give the same number every time. If they do, you figure out what your k is. Take a second and try to figure that out on your own. Some of the numbers will be easier to look at than others, I'm sure. If you thought k equals 5, you'd be right. No matter what two pairs of these numbers I multiply together, each x, y pair, 0.8 times 6.25 is 5. 1 times 5 is 5, and so on. So our formula would be y equals 5 over x. That takes care of part b for us. It says express y as a function of x. So part c says graph your function and the data together for x is bigger than 0. We've got six points that we can plot, plus we can check to see if that's right using our skills from pre-calculus or a graphing calculator. Either way, go ahead and try this on your own. Pause the video. See if you get the same thing I did. And that's it. All the points should fit smoothly. Next up, let's take a look at some polynomials. If you remember from pre-cal, number of maximum bumps that you'll find in a polynomial is always equal to one less than the degree. So in something like a second degree or a parabola, the most you'll find is one bump. Third degree, you can find up to two bumps. Fourth degree, you can find three, and so on. A big part of calculus is going to be figuring out where exactly those bumps are, and then we'll be able to draw the graphs effectively. We never learned how to figure out where those were until the very end of honors pre-cal when we started finding derivatives. We'll be doing a lot more of that as we move forward. You might also remember graphing rational functions in pre-calculus. Rational functions were functions that had a polynomial on top and bottom. Most importantly, that polynomial on the bottom should not be a constant has to be something with a variable for it to really fit into what we consider a rational function. Rational functions have 
asymptotes. They have holes. So here you see a hole. Here you see some asymptotes. Sometimes a rational function doesn't have any of those things. It's kind of rare, but it happens. Next up is some things that we have not seen before, and we'll learn how to graph pretty successfully in calculus using some of the new skills we'll learn. They're called algebraic functions because they involve powers of x, but those powers of x don't necessarily have to be nice like polynomials. We can have powers of x like to the two-thirds, or cube roots, or square roots, things like that. We spent a lot of time in pre-cal graphing trig functions, which we're going to see coming up in a couple of examples. We have to remember how to find various things in a trig function. We need to know how to find an amplitude, a period, and we have to apply any appropriate shifts. We'd also have to take care of any reflections that might happen because of negative signs or things like that. So we'll be seeing some of that in today's lesson. So the next example says, make sketches of the following graphs that show the period and amplitude. I'm going to show you two ways to find period. One way that we learned in pre-cal using the endpoints. When I say endpoints, they're not really endpoints. I'm talking about endpoints of a period. There's also a formula you can use if you're the formula type of person. So let's take a look at what exactly we did in pre-cal. We'll do part A together, then I might have you try some on your own as well. The first thing I taught in pre-cal for these was to find the endpoints. Again, these are the endpoints with air quotes. It's the end of the period. And what we learned was that the period for sine went from 0 to 2 pi. Except we're not looking at x on the inside anymore. So I'll erase that x and change it to a 2 pi x. Then we tried to solve for x, which is a simple matter of dividing everything by 2 pi. That was the first step. The second thing I had you do in pre-cal was figure out where your middle points would be. We wanted five points total, if you recall. Our first and our last are going to be the zero and one. Then we need to figure out what's halfway between that, one half. And then what's halfway between those points as well. If you don't remember how to do that, what I'm really doing is just finding the averages of some numbers there. It might be worth mentioning right now also to remember what the parent function of sine x looks like. Normally, sine goes up to 1 and down to negative 1. Because of that 3, we're now going to go up to 3 down to negative 3. We still start at 0, and we go up to 3, 0, negative 3, 0. We would come up with some new points after we apply the shift, but there isn't going to be a shift on this particular function. We won't see a shift until part C. Shifts work the same in almost every type of function. We can now sketch the graph. We've got enough information. We know we're going to want to go from 0 to 1, put in our middle points. Decimals or fraction doesn't really matter. Go up to 3, down to negative 3. And we can plot our five points. And draw a nice smooth curve. We still haven't answered the question of amplitude and period. Period means how far do you have to go before you repeat yourself. And there's a couple of easy ways to figure out period. 
one, you can take the biggest number minus the smallest number, one minus zero. And we get the period as one. We could also do the same thing looking at the graph. We start at zero, end at one, so the period is one. A lot of books also give you a formula for period called 2 pi over b. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. But b happens to be the number next to x on the inside of sine or cosine. And that 2 pi over b formula works for sine and cosine, not tangent. Amplitude. Normally the easiest thing to figure out, you just look at that leading coefficient and take the absolute value. Absolute value of 3 is 3. Another way you can get amplitude is you take your biggest point of y values minus your smallest and divide by 2. Either way, you get 3. That's how you find amplitude. At this point, I'm going to have you pause the video. I recommend you try B and C on your own. The shift on part C might be a little tricky. I'll put up work for both, and I'll talk a little bit about that shift in part C. Again, right now, pause the video, try these on your own. So here we've got part B. A couple things worth mentioning. If you don't know the parent function for a cosine curve, you're going to be messed up from the beginning. If you notice, my final answer looks like it's upside down from that. That's because I took into consideration the minus sign at the beginning. That minus sign flips the entire function. It's pretty standard going from 0 to 2 pi, and then finding my new endpoints, which I transcribed to my table over here. And instead of starting at 1, like my parent function would for y, I would start at 4, except I'm flipped. That's why I start at negative 4. 0, 4, 0, negative 4. I can plot all those points and draw my curve. Figure out my period and my amplitude using either of the methods I showed you on the previous example. That's it for this one. For part C, I'm going to have you do part of it on your own. Go ahead and try to find the endpoints, the middle points, and fill in your table. Do that on your own, then we'll talk about it together from there. Go ahead and pause the video. As you hopefully noticed, there wasn't a whole lot to figuring out your <clears throat> endpoints and middle points. The trick comes from that plus one. You've got to apply a shift. Because that shift is not on the inside of the sine function, that shift is affecting the y values. So one way of thinking about that is to say, what's the shift? All the x values don't change at all. All the y values go up by 1. So at this point, you could rewrite your table for your new x and new y values. A shift is not going to affect your amplitude. A shift is not going to affect your period. So you could actually identify those before we do anything else. Go ahead and pause the video and figure those out real quick, see if you get the same thing as me. Congratulations, hopefully. Now I'm going to apply my shift. All my x values stay the same. All my y values go up by 1. So instead of 0, 1. Instead of 1, 2, and so on. At this point, we can plot our five ordered pairs, draw a smooth curve, and we're done. Once we've got all those points plotted, we should see a sine curve that's shifted up one unit, which is exactly what we have here. That's it. Next up, we're going to take a look at some more complicated looking sine curves. We've already seen what happens with a number in front. What we haven't seen is what happens when the inside starts getting a little messier. So we're going to try to find the amplitude and period 
of a messier function. You remember, amplitude's always the easiest. Hopefully you remember how to find that, no problem. And for period, you get a couple of choices. You can use that formula of period equals 2 pi over b. In this case, b is 2. Or you can find the endpoints and then subtract them. I'll go ahead and show both ways. You try it whatever way you want. See if your answer matches up with mine. Take a look at period first. Notice with the formula, I got my period pretty fast. I just needed to plug numbers into the formula and I was done. Using the endpoint method took a lot longer, but the endpoint method also tells us more information. If I were going to graph this, I would have to go through that process anyway to get those endpoints. So depending on what you're really looking for, you have options. No way is necessarily better than the other. For amplitude, the formula was the fastest way. It's the absolute value of whatever that leading coefficient is. I didn't do the other method because to do the other method, you really need to look at the graph, where you take the highest point minus the lowest point divided by 2. And that's it for this lesson. Go ahead and try the quick check exercises and come in with good questions. Have a wonderful day.